Hi, so good afternoon. My name is Damuel Morales and I work with NRCS. Um, Justin's there in the back. So if, if you guys have any questions, feel free to come up to us and we will definitely help you. So um, with NRCS, we are the Natural Resource Conservation Service um, inside the USDA and we help farmers or whomever has land with resource concerns on their farms that they could be causing things as simple as erosion or plant productivity and all those type of problems. So we are very broad with the things that we can help. Um, we we have easements, we do wetlands, we help farmers, we do forest plants in Eastern Kentucky. We do a bunch of different things. So there's a lot of things we can help with. Um, the first step, and I'd say that's the most important step, is having a farm or having a property that we could help. It doesn't have to be just a farm. It could be um, we're working a lot more with smaller farms, helping with high tunnels and stuff like that. Um, and once you have that rental agreement, that lease or the property you own, um, the next step will be going to our sister agency, and that one will be the for, um, FSA. Um, they are usually in the same building as us, and you have to go in with them, do eligibility, and get a farm number. And from that on, then you go to the F to the NRCS office, sorry, and fill up an application. Once you have an application in, one of our, our soil conservationists will call you, and they'll do a farm visit. They'll go to the location, um, and they'll do a in-depth inspection of the land and help you see um, any problems or issues that might be occurring. Um, again, those could be sometimes as simple as pests or um, deficiencies in the soils, um, things like that. And once that's done, they will do a conservation plan. And if you need um, financial assistance, you could receive financial assistance from us, but that will have to be after a ranking process. So if you get approved under that ranking process, um, you could get financial assistance to implement up to a 75%, Justin, if it's historically underserved. Um, and then some historically underserved farmers are not interested. Yeah, some historically underserved could get up to 90% of the cost share mm -hmm. to implement those practices. So again, it could be like um, covered crops, waterways for row crops. It could be rotation for cattle, water tanks. If it's a vegetable farmer, it could be high tunnels micro irrigation and a lot of other things that we could help. And again, we are here to help the people help the land. So whatever you guys need, we have an office nearby. We have one here in Hopkinsville and the other one closest, I think it will be Princeton. We are all through the state. So we're just here to help. And if you guys need something else, just let us know. Thank uh, you. Yes. Explain how important it is for people to keep their AIs and in order to continue. Yes. So um, for next year, um, the deadline has already passed by, but you have to get an application in. And every year after October, you have to update your AGI and sometimes the AD 1026, I think it is, with Farm Service. If you don't have those up to date, you won't be eligible when we start doing the farm visits. We might do the farm visit, but you might not be eligible to receive the financial assistance. We can still do regular conservation assistance, but we won't pay for the conservation practices. So it is really important that after October, every producer goes through FSA and updates the eligibility. And also, the first thing is to go on to the NRCS website. You know, there's a long list of initiatives, mm -hmm. but they each state has a long list of initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so you explain a little yes. bit about <laughs> so so usually there there are a lot of things going on through the state so we have different programs it just gets a little bit complicated but usually equip will be the program for first time or if you have work on your farm equip will be the one usually um and equip is environmental quality incentive program and that one's really broad we could do a lot of work with it then we have um csp that one's like a step over equip after you've done a lot of things with equip and that one will just be um, some type of stewardship. Then we have other regional programs. Um, those are focused conservation projects, but those will depend and vary depending on where you're at because those are focused on certain areas. Um, 
and we will have RCPPs and different type of programs, but usually EQIP will be the one to go with. And those programs, I'll stay with you in a minute. Um, it's how, so it's how farmers go in and yes. state what's going on on their land and how they get initiatives implemented into the state, correct? So let's say, for example, you may have a monarch initiative in another area. Yes. Because, you know, a lot of people are going to express that there's a need for that. Mm -hmm. And that's how it needs to be. That's how it needs to be. Yeah. So that would probably be a focused conservation project. Mm -hmm. If it's doing like um, work on the farm, it will probably be equipped. Um, we do some some like community meetings. You could go to the office, and if you and if you want to do like a certain initiative, like a monarch stuff, mm -hmm. um, that will go through the super DC of the area, mm -hmm. and. Um, so you could go to any office and let them know, you know, like you want a meeting with Super DC and let them know that you want to um, try to work a bigger problem on a certain area. Um, that could be a focus project, but that has to go up um, to state level and review. So not every focus project might get approved, but that's not a discouragement either because we have a lot of different focus projects. Um, we have some in Eastern Kentucky for um, locations with not 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 as accessible to food. So we've been putting high tunnels for people to produce their um, local foods and stuff like that. We also have some watershed um, projects. So those those will vary from, from site to site. I think a lot of the farmers are how important it is to go to the local conservation. Oh, yes. Order to get the mm -hmm. Yes. And and it, that's a community thing. You know, once if, if the community has a good relationship with NRCS and stuff, they usually go in and and they know about these stuff, but it's important just to be there, just to know what things could be done and, and things like that. Yeah. You had a question? Sorry. Last 12 months, uh, legislation came down for a farm. Mm -hmm. And as I uh, look at the farm, it's about 30 acres. Mm -hmm. And the farm is about 1,200. So we Um so there was some confusion with that. Um a lot of people get scared when they see the term urban farming because they are not used to working with urban farms and they think it's different. I just see them as a small farm because they are the same operation basically as a big farm, you know. But um, that was, that, were you able to get a form number and all that kind of stuff set up? So it was, did you file in an application with the EQIP for the EQIP? Yes, probably not. Justin, do you know something about that? But uh, So when it comes into your EQIP application, it's gonna come down to ranking. So it doesn't matter how many acres you have. Um, it matters what your overall, um, oh, what am I looking for? The, yeah, the uh, ranking number. The so there, there's a threshold. Um, we we can talk a little bit more just to see where where how far they got in and see what happened there. But there should be a threshold that they did a farm visit. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. So so yeah. There's so they they do like a a state. <laughs> so so there's a state pool that that'll probably be the equip. Um, so that system that we do the ranking on will take um, a lot of geo stuff and endangered species and um, impair streams and rivers into consideration. So it gives you a, um, like a point system. So the higher you are, the most chances you get um, to be, to selected. get the financial, yeah, to be selected and get the financial assistance. So, so it's not that you got denied, it's maybe that, your farm was still not high enough on the on how urgent the help was needed, and and sometimes it'll take a year. It'll take two. So uh, I guess the next thing, if people make adjustments on their farm, they need to be aware to resubmit a new application. Because sometimes it just roll over, correct? And a lot of people are unaware to you know go and submit a new application. So, the, so if they roll over, it's okay, because um we next year you just do the eligibility and you just. Oh, the the yep, that's right. the important thing. If you don't update it, that's when you get kicked out of the system for us. But we we can figure let 
let's see, you know, how that went out and Frank's yeah. here. So we can check um, what happens with your application a little bit better just to explain. Because it's sometimes a little bit difficult just to see how the ranking process works. But maybe now with the next form bill, it gives certain, you know, um, funds just for urban farming. So that that could be an advantage. But it's it's just those things that we just kind of have to wait and move out. But we'll check out with Frank now in a couple of minutes and see what how that went. Any other questions? Well, oh, yep, sorry. Do you, so as part of your service, and we can get into some of our parts and stuff, um, like we have 47 acres of woods that we purchased last year, and we want to do something with it, but we don't know what. And we definitely want to preserve it. Yep. So as part of your service, that you would come out and just help us figure out what that is. Yes. So so we would probably get um, one of our foresters to go out and do um, like a forest inventory, and that could. Oh, sorry. And whatever the forester um, tells us to go with, that's what we'll do. But probably it could be timber. If you want to harvest some timber and do a renewal, we could do those kind of things from um, remove invasive species. Um, if you want to conserve it and just do wildlife, they could help with that as well. So there there are a lot of options into forestry as well. And those farm visits don't cost. It's yep, pretty it's charged free. for us to come out and give you that farm visit and also give you a conservation plan. Okay. Um, and then how long um, I'm not sure, Frank. You gotta do it. How long we usually take for farm visit? Yeah. If he's in this area, I just wanna. Yeah, yeah. It, a lot of it just depends on our workload. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, we try to go in out there at least within a month. Mm -hmm. you know, yep. Sometimes it may be a little yep. bit longer. On the workload, but usually it depends on a month's time. Sometimes we can get out there the next day. Other times, maybe a few weeks. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, hope hope you have a great day. I don't know how you're gonna move, but that works. It works. <laughs> That's good. Uh, it, uh, yeah, those are two two of the things we fund. And the next one up there, what we do. Well, I'm uh, I'm Brian Lacefield. I'm the executive director of the Kentucky Office of Ag Policy. For three years, we've been the Kentucky Office of Ag Policy, but you may know us under our previous name of the Governor's Office of Ag Policy. But uh, uh, in a nutshell, depending on uh, uh, which hat we're wearing, our mission has been the been the same as we administer the uh, master settlement dollars that are appropriated for agriculture in Kentucky. Now, what is the master settlement agreement? Uh, well, this is the, the biggest civil litigation that uh, our country ever had when all the states were suing the attorney generals for all the, uh, the different states were suing the big tobacco companies for healthcare related illnesses that were associated with cigarette consumption. The Tobacco company settled with the states for an agreed upon sum of funds that uh, is paid annually based on national cigarette sales and based on uh, population. When this happened, Kentucky had uh, over half of our farms in Kentucky, 54% of our farms, nearly 50,000 farm families in Kentucky were raising tobacco. So we were very tobacco dependent. Not only were these farm families impacted, but this was 25% of our ag receipts. This was a major driver in our, our rural communities across the state. So the legislator, legislatures and, uh, and members of the ag community in the, the late 1990s, early 2000, had the foresight and the vision to know this was the beginning of a paradigm shift in agriculture in Kentucky. And so they set aside a significant portion, up to 50% of the available funds to go back out to producers and to ag businesses and to agricultural organizations with a mission of trying to diversify Kentucky away from tobacco and to, to grow our net farm income. So that, uh, that is what we do. I've got copies of our annual report. It is a great uh, way to showcase a lot of what we do. And this, uh, this legislation that was put together that put these funds back out didn't really give a direction on how these were supposed to go out. So this has been uh, the last 23 years, what I call the great experiment on what we're trying to do to try to 
go back to that simple mission of diversifying away from tobacco and to grow net farm income. Now, some of our counties were more tobacco dependent than others. So 40% uh, of our annual funds will go out to the counties based on how much tobacco dependency they had right at the, the, the late 1990s. So uh, it varies considerably. We had two counties in Kentucky, uh, Knott and Pike, that had no barley tobacco. So they, they received no dollars. And uh, the number one county in Kentucky, based on dependency, Fort Burley, uh, we raised a lot of tobacco down in this part of the state, but it, we're just talking about Burley, uh, is Barron County. So uh, last year, about $16 million went out to 118 counties, and it varied from zero for those two that got nothing to $400,000. So you have funds available at the county level that uh, that can go towards uh, different types of incentive-based cost share programs. Uh, anybody ever heard of CAIP, uh, C-A-I-P, the County Ag Investment Program? Okay, that is probably by far our most popular program. That is a cost share program that uh, that that drives incentives. It's a, an incentive base to try to uh, create incentives to try best practices, you know, research that's coming down from our two land grant universities. You may think, okay, this is a good, uh, good practice, but I don't know. It's a little different than what I've done on my farm. But what if you can get 50% of it paid for 75%, I may try it. That's, that's the mission of that program, but that's not the only thing these county funds can be used for. They can be used for uh, uh, individual projects. Uh, they're all based on, on application based on merit. And, and so we, uh, we, we see a, a, a myriad of, uh, of different projects funded. We also have state funds that, uh, that go out to fund uh, a lot of big regional projects, creating markets, creating value-added agriculture, and, uh, and then also funding a lot of our organizations. Uh, Kentucky Proud, uh, that's been, uh, been one that we're, we're funding. We've got KCARD coming up uh, next. That's uh, another one of our great, uh, uh, great success stories. We have uh, uh, different commodity groups that uh, provide the technical expertise to help uh, producers transition away from tobacco. Uh, we also, in 2004, took a portion of these funds and set up a lending program. So grants are great. You know, I, I always uh, encourage folks, uh, you know, apply for, for grants, but we also have a low interest loan program. And this, uh, this has been a very successful project. Uh, we have grown this from an initial $20 million investment to over 120 million in assets today. But uh, we do participation loans. We work with whoever your lender is, be it uh, any any lending institution that has at least a branch in Kentucky. We make sure they at least have a presence in Kentucky, and we'll work with whoever you're working with. These uh, our funds are the subordinate dollars. They come in and take that second or third security position, so that helps that that primary lender feel better about uh, their 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 collateral position. And then we loan our dollars at a below market interest rate. I'm an old banker. I started using this program in 2007 uh, and it's it's a fantastic program, but my world used to live and die by the 10 year treasury, 4.18 that's what it was today. I still check it every day because that was how all my source of fundings was, uh, was based. However, our rates don't change. Our money is always loaned out at 2%, and we allow that uh, that participating lender to put uh, 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent on top to pay them for servicing the loan. They get to keep that, and all we get is 2%. We can fix that rate for up to 15 years. Uh, so today's interest rate environment, that looks very attractive uh, because at 4.18 at the 10-year, banks usually put a pretty good spread on top of that, so our long-term rates are now in the 8 9%. So that blended rate, if you can utilize this program, gets that uh, that below what I call the historic inflation rate at three percent. We never change the rates, so our our demand for this program uh, ebbs and flows based on the current interest rate environment and how tough things are looking in the the banking world. So uh, first eighteen months I was in this job, we were seeing about a million dollars of request every month, and that was about what that portfolio was returning to us in return of principal and interest. Well, the last few months it's been three to four million a month, and uh, and so we're we're having to have additional funds come from the ag development fund to keep this. But we've got our primary, our bread and butter program is our beginning farm loan program, 
And this one, we talked uh, earlier, my colleagues from USDA and NRCS uh, mentioned our, our sister agency, Farm Service Agency. Uh, they also have a beginning farm loan program, but when you're looking at the federal programs, they require three years of farming experience. And that's usually documented by three Schedule Fs. You have got to, to file three Schedule Fs or have a college degree in agriculture and two Schedule Fs, or you need to be able to document you've been making management decisions uh, uh, if you didn't file, file the taxes. Our program will work with true beginning farmers. That is one of the things we wanted to do is to make ours more inclusive because we require uh, you're working with a participating lender. So number one, you've already got a, a lender that's working with you. We require a mentor, somebody that's not a family member and somebody that does not have any uh, financial investment in your operation be able to uh, to serve as your, your mentors. We feel like that helps uh, mitigate some of the risk with these beginning farm loans. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we're covering that gap that uh, that you may have a, a barrier to capital if you didn't have the three years of experience. And that's about two thirds of the loans in our loan portfolio. We also have an infrastructure loan program, which is what it sounds like. It's anything that is on your farm, but not the farm land or not your primary residence, but it can be grain bins, barns, uh, sheds, greenhouses, uh, irrigation. I mean, it, the basic, again, anything that's, uh, that's some type of infrastructure. We have a program that's for ag businesses we have one for processors uh, that uh, where you're creating some type of value added, and then uh, a, a one we've uh, we've got is for large and food animal veterinarians. Our loans will be uh, fifty up to fifty percent of the project with a max of two hundred and fifty thousand. So again, we can do two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars fixed, two point seven five percent up to fifteen years, and again we take that subordinate position. It's a fantastic project. We again, we work with uh, all the the lenders in Kentucky, and I am very proud that uh, we've grown this to 120 million in assets. We've done over 200 million in loans, over 1,300 loans, and I'm very proud to to say this. I'm knocking on wood too. I don't want to jinx myself, but we we've only had four losses in in 20 years of doing this and 1,300 loans. I've loaned a lot of money to a lot of people. Life happens. Sometimes you have hiccups. Some things things don't work out. But uh, to be able to do that, and I, I credit that to the the strength of our participating lenders and the the quality of the the applications they're sending to us. Uh, so that's uh, that's a big uh, big piece of what we do. Again, we've got grants at state and uh, and the local level, and uh, we'll be here to answer questions on on anything. I, I will piggyback on our, our comments. I, I, I think, Tommy, you, you mentioned it good. We come up here, we're we're all from the government. We're all here to help, right? We all throw out a whole bunch of uh, an acronyms and a bunch of initials and things to do. And it is intimidating when you start looking at where do I start? And I think you you started off great with leading off with extension. That is always uh, where, where I would uh, start off with what to do and uh, do these things. But we also know a lot about each other's programs. And so if you're in talking to me about what we do, we're an incentive-based program. We, we like conservation, but that's not our mission. We've got another agency that does that. And we're usually familiar enough with the other programs to say, you know, what you're looking at may not fit what we do, but let me give you a referral to my colleagues at uh, NRCS or FSA, or first you may need to stop at KCARD and get a business plan developed or something. So, you know, that uh, I, I find in our, our world that uh, there is a big team spirit in the world of ag. We are, we're a small little community uh, in, in Kentucky, and it doesn't matter whether I thought that was a good, good comment uh, you made about urban farming. You know, urban farming is farming. It's just on a smaller scale. It's more concentrated. It's just a different way. It's all agriculture. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, the, the biggest or the, the smallest farm in Kentucky. It's still agriculture, and that's still the team we're all on. And so, being able to to just start that conversation and figure out what programs are there, uh, there there's a lot of things out there to help, especially beginning farmers and 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 folks that have come up with with great ideas and want to enhance their operation. It's just trying to figure out which agency funds those and uh, and and again start that conversation. And I promise, if you're talking with one of my my, my fourteen, if it doesn't fit us, we'll try to we'll try to send you to the person that uh, that it will fit. All right. Any questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you all.
color is uh, coffee and water is not so reserved anybody. Uh, forgot to tell you all that, but that's for you all just come and go as you please. Figured it out on my own. Oh, technology is great. Um, hi everybody. I'm Taryn, and I'm with KCARD, Kentucky Center for Ag and Rural Development. Um, and the very first thing that I want you all to know is that everything I'm getting ready to tell you is free. <laughs> we do not charge a single penny for anything that I'm getting ready to tell you about. That is in large account due to uh, ag development. Uh, I'm really glad that you said that we are the best program that you've ever seen come out. I, I uh, that was what I heard. Go, go. I, I roll with it. I, that's what I heard. I don't know if everybody heard Tanya. Tanya heard that. So, uh, uh, but yeah, appreciate the kind words. Um, so, um, so again, everything is free that I'm getting ready to tell you. What I really love about my job is that I work one-on-one -on -one with the farmer or the ag business. And that looks different to every single farmer. Sometimes I'm at their kitchen table <laughs> while they're looking through their numbers. Uh, sometimes I'm on a Zoom, telephone, you know, or I've even met people at McDonald's before to talk about how we can help their business. No two farms are the same. What this farm needs may not be what this farm needs. But what I really like is that we start wherever that farm needs us to start. You know, some folks, they already have a system in place. They have QuickBooks and they track every single thing that goes in and out of their business. Great, we can help. Some farmers bring us shoe boxes with their receipts in them and we help figure that out. So wherever that farm is, is our starting point. Now we do focus on the business side of farming. So if you're looking for production, if you're looking for somebody to come to your woods, don't come to me. I don't, I'm gonna get lost in them. Um, but I can help you talk about where you want your farm to be. Maybe you have this idea and it's up here and maybe you're here and you have no idea how to get from here to here. That's what really what we're really good about helping with. Um, I'm a big fan of goals. I'm the biggest nerd when it comes to goals. Uh, if I were to talk about that, uh, we would be here all day. So I'm going to keep it tight. Uh, goals are something that we work with, though. We help you figure out what those small targets are to get you up here. You know, for example, I always use an orchard as an example. If you come to us and you say, I want to be an orchard, great. How many trees are you going to plant in year one? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's what we can help with. We help you plan out what that's going to cost, what that's going to look like, and then ultimately in 10 years, what you're going to be. Now, a lot of times that is because people want money, right? Uh, most of the time when our phone rings, it is, hey, um, I want a grant, <laughs> right? Uh, my neighbor down the road, he got a grant and now I want a grant. Uh, so we do help with that. We don't write the grant for you, but we significantly hold your hand through the process. Um, we'll review it for you. We send out newsletters that make sure that you know what funding is coming up. Um, and then we kind of help you through that whole process. Um, also loans. So if a business is looking for a loan, we can help with the business plan. Uh, some business plans are very lengthy. Some are two pages. When we start talking, oh, you need a business plan. People immediately start stepping back because they're like, oh, that's a lot of work that I don't want to do. And we can help with that. We help with the research. We help dig through the numbers with you. Essentially, we are there with you every step of the way no matter what you need. Sometimes you just need to bounce ideas off of people. I talked to one of my clients on the way here and she just, she's working with a person who is a restaurant owner who wants to start buying produce from her. And she's like, I don't even know the first thing about selling to a restaurant. 
So we talked through some stuff. And sometimes that's all people need. Sometimes it's, hey, I have some really great people who can help you with that. And we um, give them some resources. But I think what I want you all to remember is that wherever a farm starting point is, that's our starting point with them. And we can help them from there. No matter if they've been in existence for 30 years and they're wanting to do an expansion or they're just starting up, we can be there from start to finish. Do y'all have any questions? I will be here. So if y'all have any questions, let me know. All right, good deal. Thank you. Over this one first. Okay, um, so my name is Lindsay Crumby, and I work with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture in our Division of Food Distribution. Um, and I'm one of our grants administrators that manages three USDA programs. Um, but the one that I'm going to talk about today is our Local Food Purchase Assistance or LFPA grant program. So this program, um, it's got a lot of flexibility and a lot of cool things that we get to do. Uh, and it's kind of an inaugural uh, opportunity that the department gets to take. Um, but overall, it's a little over $11 million from the USDA that we were allocated in order to strengthen and expand our local food supply chain resiliency. And boots on the ground, that means how do we provide more markets to farmers in our state? And then how do we feed more communities? Um, so with Division of Food Distribution, we always get to focus on doing the community distribution of food side, but now we get to kind of dabble in the farmer and procurement side and making those relationships. So this has been a really cool grant program where um, kind of as Taryn said, where we like to do one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of what we're doing now is we're able to actually make some direct partnerships and relationships with farmers in Kentucky. Um, and we do get to prioritize socially disadvantaged farmers. So those are people who self-identify within a specific list of classes. So those are your age, sex, race, um, if you have ever been a recipient of um, social programs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a definition where when it's time to sign up for the program, you can kind of say yes or no to what those mean. But we get to prioritize you, which means that if someone comes to our program with the same product as you, but yours might be a little bit higher, if they don't identify at self-identify at socially disadvantaged, but you do, we'll still buy your product because it's not about the buck. It's about what the benefit to the farmer coming to the table. So overall, we get to buy um, pretty much any agricultural food or food product. Um, there's a little bit of a limitation when it comes to processed goods. We can buy them if they're still local. It's just the number that I can buy is a little limited. But for the most part, if it's unprocessed or minimally processed, um, then we are able to buy all of your produce, meats, eggs, dairy products, whatever. Um, it just kind of depends on what that um, product is and the type of certification that you might need. Um, but when you come to me to talk about actual products, then I can kind of tell you what will apply to you and what wouldn't. Overall, um, the important part for the farmer, uh, which is something too that we have to, we're trying to be more um, transparent about, is that yes, we are providing a significant opportunity as far as financial growth goes for farms. But at the end of the day, this program is not sustainability and money. This program is sustainability and relationships. We are in, in introducing you into new retail markets that you have never entered, or you're uh, kind of interacting with them in a different way than you might have before that has been created on behalf of this program. So yes, you may, you there's potential, you could make a whole lot of money in LFPA as you participate. But once we leave, it's what you learned on that track while participating here, that's gonna propel you once our funds leave in 2025. Uh, oh, sorry, this is really little, I can't read. Um, so the last thing I will say is that um, with the products that we're purchasing, so if it's produce, it's gonna be number ones. No number twos can be purchased. And then for your meat, they do have to be inspected under um, USDA inspection for majority of people. There are a couple of my contractors who allow state inspection for specific meat commodities. Um, and if that's the case, then I have got a whole list where I can tell you exactly what applies to them. 
Um, but for the most part, just some kind of inspection. It can't be custom and it can't be you independently processing yourself. Overall, whenever these come in, when I, you know, we hand you the check, we want to pay you the retail value for those products. We don't want your wholesale. We want whatever is not just not gonna make you break even, but actually give you a little to stack your pocket. We want what the true cost is for that agricultural product. That's what we want you to submit the offer to us for, and we will pay that. So we decided to build three different tracks in this grant program. Um, most states stuck with um, funneling the funds through their statewide network of food banks, which is a um, very beneficial and profitable track but we felt that that didn't represent all of our farmers here. So with our network of food banks, that is through Feeding Kentucky, and you can enter into purchasing agreements or point in time offers of products that you have as you have them. And um, you would then just have to take those items to your new, nearest food bank or food bank distribution center. Depending on where you're at, um, it kind of depends on where exactly that is. Um, but for, we have a list and a map that I can show you if you want to see what's nearest to you or what's, uh, what distance is attainable for you to drive. But uh, that one is that track. Then we have the second track, which is frozen meals. And we are doing that in partnership with God's Pantry Food Bank out of Lexington, who is also using the facility of Free Store Food Bank up in Cincinnati. And they're doing the same thing. They're buying uh, agricultural products. Then they're taking those, processing them down into um, ready to heat up in 15 minutes or less. Meals that still bring that local component to the home, but you don't have to come home and make it. You can just pull it out and it's just as fresh as if you did it. I'm not going to say it's better because your cooking is always better than anybody else's, but it's still great. It's good. It's nutritious. Um, and we are hoping to expand that here soon. Um, but so far in my next slide, I'll show you kind of what our metrics look like. But we've done a whole lot of purchasing through that frozen meals program that has warranted us to figure out how much more can we push out. So we are looking into, which I believe in January, February, we will also be moving into family size meals. So rather than individual, you know, several ounce servings, we are looking to see what we what we can make for families um, in the household size that will be um, more of a bulk six-ish serving is size. Then the last track is our biggest one. That one is food boxes. And this one we decided to solicit for third-party aggregators and distributors for us. So we decided to award four contracts with um, Creation Gardens, who is doing business as What Just Want. We also have Food Chain, who is out of Lexington, Central Kentucky Growers out of Georgetown, and then Homegrown Direct out of Georgetown. And they each have their own contracts where they are also purchasing, aggregating, and distributing, taking all of the products that they're buying from farmers like you guys, and they're boxing them up and then taking them to the most underserved communities in our state that need them. Um, so it's a perfect way to serve your community, but not just maybe your local one, but you, your food can move 500 miles from you and someone else can still see, well, I got this product from this farm that was here. So looking at what we did um, in, at the end of quarter three, which was the end of October. So at that time, we had a little bit over $800,000 of farmer impact and farmer impact to us means money that went directly to the farmer into their pocket for what we bought. Um, of, for the meals, we had a little under 7,000 meals produced at that time. Then for food boxes, we had 4,000. And then the sustainability factor, that goes back to our socially disadvantaged um, preference. So uh, of my farmers, a certain percentage self-identified. And so I take that number and then that's the funds that go to these prefer this preferential demographic group. Um, I will say I don't have my numbers finalized yet because we still have one more round of reporting, but our current farmer impact reached a million dollars last month. So now we're a little almost at $1.2 million of direct farm purchasing. And granted, we started buying in July. Yes, this summer. Yeah. So we're moving fast. <laughs> um, so a little bit over 1.2-ish is where we're at. With our frozen meals, we are um, closer to eight to 9,000 now with our meals. In our food boxes, they took off. They hit the ground running. And so I went from 4,000 boxes in a week and a half period, and now I'm about 15 or 16,000. By December 31 is how many boxes I've pushed out. And that's just in about a month and a half of bringing on the last of our partners. Um, so yes, we are moving very, very quickly. So 
the more farmers we can get in our program, the better, because it's more food that we can move to our communities, but also more relationships we can build with you guys. Of our farmers, I always like to tell people who's participating within that demographic. So at the end of Q3, we had 73 farmers and 91% of them were socially disadvantaged. On this slide, um, you all will get this sent out later, but I wanted to give you links to my grant webpage if those of you who are online. That way you can go and look. Um, I have all of the tracks information on there, my contact information, and then what's the producer guide. And the producer guide is kind of like your A to Z of LFPA. So it's anything that you could or might want to know about what it takes to participate, where your food might be going, who can you, who's buying, things of that nature. Um, all the information is in this guide. And then for those of us here in person, I do have QR codes, which if you want to scan it. Um, so the farmer interest survey, that's the best thing to do for me because that will send your information directly to my inbox. And then I will turn around and reach back out to you and give you um, explicit information about the program and how to get started. Um, now, if today you already have an idea of what products you've got available that you want to submit an offer for, we can talk about that. Um, and then you can also see where I'm gonna be traveling here in the next couple of months for hidden conference season. So I'm gonna be all over the state at many events. Um, and so if you ever see me, I, I'm always a good person. I'm always ready to talk offers. So if you have a product that you're thinking about and you wanna run your quantities and your price by me, do it. Find me wherever I'm at and I, I build them with farmers. Um, that's a lot of what I do is doing that on their behalf. And I'm happy to either work with you throughout the whole time, or if you feel like you get a gist of it and you want to do it by yourself and start talking to them by yourself, go for it. I'm doing whatever you need. But if I need to do your offers every time, I do it already. It's okay. I can do it. <laughs> so this is my contact information. Um, as I said, I will be traveling a lot. So normally I'm good with the phone, but right now, email me first because you probably won't catch me on the cell phone. And then I'll get back to you as soon as I can or set up a time to where I can make sure that I can tell people to leave me alone so I can talk to you. So uh, yes, that's my info if you want to get a hold of me. Um, and then, of course, you've got the links that will be sent out later. Um, if you have questions today, just let me know. We'll be over there. Yes. <laughs> I have picked up. A lot of farmers have asked me what, how much paperwork is involved mm -hmm. in them doing this program. Sure. So she asked about paperwork. Um, the only requirement as far as paperwork goes is an agreement form. Um, and that form typically is just your full name, farm name, farm name, your farm number, um, physical address of the farm, county, and phone number. One time. Yes. As soon as you fill that out for each track or contractor, then that will last you for the rest of the program. Um, and even if you want to fill it out, but you're not ready to submit an offer right now, but you want to get it out of the way and have it done for March when you actually will start harvesting, then you can still do that. Uh, it doesn't matter. So whenever offers come in, we just go back to this master folder is essentially what it is. And we just make sure that you filled it out before we look at your offers to process them. Um, but outside of that, as soon as you do an uh, interest form, then everything else is might be like a purchase order, bill of lading, things of that nature, but it's all about the procurement, but not to sign up for the program. So if they've not procured off, mm -hmm. they work with you, sign up, not procured off, then they would have paperwork at the wherever they got procured off. Would that be an ongoing thing, or is that just a one time thing as well? So it de depends on who the contractors are. So at the food bank's level, if you're dropping off to a food bank, you will get a purchase order via email as part of the confirmation of Feeding Kentucky accepting your offer for your product. You'll take that PO, um, you'll print it, and then you'll have your own invoice. So you will have to create an invoice. You don't already have one. Um, and I help farmers with that too. Um, I just give them off of QuickBooks. They're free and you can download them. Um, and if, <laughs> if you need help put it, making it fancy, I can do that. Um, so you just take those two things physically in person to that food bank then they will worry about weighing it, taking it, looking at it, whatever. Um, and then they will uh, take your physical invoice and then they turn it in for you. So after that, once you drop it, then you just wait for a check in the mail or your electronic funds deposit. If you are working with a private contractor, say for the food boxes, um, typically 
it will be very similar. The paperwork is going to look different or if a paper even exists since there are smaller, you know, agribusinesses that run their own thing. Um, but for the most part, it's just an additional invoice or PO that you might have to be responsible for. Um, but then after that, you just wait until you get your money, whichever way you decide to get it. <laughs> Good question. Any others? Thank you. All right, y'all. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Latoya Drake. I'm a program coordinator with Kentucky's Nutrition Education Program, and the battery is low, so I need to plug this up before we got uh, Can you get it out of my uh, backpack? So what good is all this food if nobody knows how to use it? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, we have food falling from everywhere. People are starving with bread in their hand, right? So if we get folks food and they don't know how to use it, it makes no sense. And we want to think about folks who have limited resources because that's also a good um, option to get more money through uh, double dollars, EBT funds. And there are about 550,000 people, so almost 600,000 people on EBT, EBT benefits in the state of Kentucky. That's 219,000 children. That is 60,000 people over the age of 60. And that's 202,000 people about that between 18 and 59. So part of the USDA services is the Kentucky Nutrition Education Program. And what we do is we teach folks how to do the best they can with what they have on hand, right? We want them to eat better for less. We want them to use their benefits that they receive from the government and invest them into local foods and healthy foods and do the best that they can. So. Also, we talked about extension services a bit earlier. And here's some, uh, just a slide about that. Back to what I did. So NEP is a part of the extension umbrella and we are under the family and consumer sciences umbrella, right? And we do a lot of work in Kentucky uh, in regards to educating people on how to use the food that they have access to. Our uh, main point is to address food security, right? Because so many of our neighbors are hungry. Uh, one in seven of our neighbors in Kentucky is hungry, and one in five of those folks is children. So we want to make sure folks are getting nutritious foods that are healthy and good for them, right? So um, despite the efforts of our uh, of our partners, we know how many folks are hungry. Looking at my notes. So we want to also introduce folks who are food insecure to local food because we want farmers to benefit from their uh, benefits, right? We want them to use their EBT funds at farmer's markets. We want them to double their dollars. We want them to use their WIC at farmer's markets and their senior vouchers. We want folks to go and get the local foods. And there are many reasons, and we're all aware of why it is important for us to eat local. We know that um, it's gonna help address food security. It's gonna make our, uh, our food systems more sustainable. And it's also going to encourage our uh, our local economies and also our environment, but we all know those things. And we've been um, doing some work to address food security uh, across Kentucky with our hunger in Kentucky efforts. And also through our um, resources through planetmove.com, you can find a farmer's market and food bank search engine at our website that we constantly update that's probably behind now, but if you see something wrong with the email me and I'll try to fix it because it's people running it. We're just trying to do our best. So our website, I love our website. Our website was established in 2019 and this is our public facing website. And this is how we spread the word about NEP because what we're doing at Extension is we're teaching folks how to use the food and we're also providing marketing materials, right? Because we want you to share and spread the word about what we do. So um, one of these is our public facing site, planeatmove.com. And on this site, we have uh, an abundance of information. We have um, uh, almost 400 recipes. We have how-to videos, so how to use a knife, how to cut an avocado, how to cut a sweet potato, how to cook beans, just any anything that you might think is not that difficult, but you never know what some folks might find hard to do. So we have a video and we're, uh, we're always working uh, to create new resources to help folks. Um, let's see. 
So our battle recipes, we have almost 400 budget-friendly, healthy recipes from our Cook Wild Kentucky collection. And I had the pleasure last week of working with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and some of my coworkers and testing out uh, five to six new recipes. Tried squirrel for the first time. My 20-year-old my self would not have not, like believed that I was eating squirrel <laughs> and ducks. But I tried it and squirrel is delicious. Like squirrel is like dark meat um rabbit and i never would have known that squirrel <laughs> delicious I, i'm not i could not eat it again well i would try it again it's about exposures it takes like 15 or so exposures to a food for us to enjoy it so i will continue to expose myself to squirrel when in, when encountered with it it's just me <laughs> and that's what it looks like and i love what we have here this is our cook walk and Kentucky calendar uh, and some of the extension offices still have some of these available. And it's more than just a calendar. And that's why we were taking those photos to actually get ready for the next one that we'll put out. Um, but you see the front of it, these nice little squirrel legs. Or not squirrel legs, frog legs. <laughs> I've got squirrel on the rain. These nice frog legs. There's venison. There's a uh, Cajun beaver gumbo. Right, we want to teach folks to do the best they can with what they have on hand. We don't want to yuck other people's yums. We want to encourage them to eat what they have and do the best. Even if, if that's wild game, we want them to eat that too. We also have our um, plated up Kentucky Proud recipes. And you guys have probably seen them because there's thousands of cards, like thousands at every extension office. And we want to make sure that we're passing those out. And if you're a farmer, you can have access to those cards and you can get those cards and promote, use that to promote your foods, make the recipes, pass out the cards and your, uh, a sample at the farmer's market. You want to make sure you have your sampling certificate, um, and that's something you can go through your extension office to make sure you get connected with. But use those cards, use those resources, because that's why we work so hard on those resources. We want people to eat better. We want people to do better. Another one of these great resources is our, um, and I, I'm really, I love my job, guys, most of the time. Yeah, all of the time. I love my job. I do love that I get to style the food, and it really makes me happy. This is our 2024, our new calendar. Available at all your extension offices now. The free pictures I get to put together. But these are another source of our budget-friendly KC recipes um, for free, right? Um, this is an outreach um, tool as well as an educational tool. It also has this uh, probably incorrect Kentucky Proud play, uh, produce availability chart since the weather is unpredictable these days. This appears to be incorrect. We need to do something, but I don't know what to do. But this is... That's in there to encourage folks to eat local, to encourage them to eat um, healthy. So those, pick that up at your extension office and check out the recipes at planetmove.com if you do want to access those. Also at planetmove.com is our um, our gardening Bible, right? Our home vegetable uh, gardening in, in Kentucky manual. And that's available at the extension offices as well as planetmove.com under the grow your own food tab, right? Additionally, we have um, some resources um, from our partners at KSU, um, some of their um, publications related to growing your own vegetables, including some of the ones that we've worked on. Um, and you can scan the QR code or check it out at the website and just be sure to direct folks to those resources because all of our resources are made at a sixth grade reading level or below. We want ours to be accessible. We want folks to be able to understand them um, and we want them to be usable, right? So those are available under grow your own food at planningmove.com. Also in our extension offices, we have nutrition education and we have several program or nutrition education program assistants across the state doing work to teach folks how to eat better for less. We also have county agents across the state doing that work too, whether they're family consumer sciences agencies or horticulture or ag agents teaching folks how to grow their own food. Uh, we're doing nutrition education in lots of different ways. So if you're interested in those programs, reach out to the uh, office in your county. Oh, also uh, food preservation too. We have resources that are science-based. We don't want people canning on open fire green beans. We, unless they want to kill their whole family. Like, but you don't want to, you don't want to do that. We don't want to botulism. We want to do it the science way. And we have those resources at our extension office to make sure that you're canning properly, not in the oven either. There's there's things about this. So go check that out. And then this right here, we got we, we got to do some work on it. 
we're working on it. We, we worked and we're going to keep working. And uh, Jackie, who uh, helped put this together, has left. But we, this is a great opportunity to have a really great resource is this Farm to School Hub. So uh, we'll keep pushing on it. And it does offer some um, info and just different things on connecting local producers with their school. And we have our Western Kentucky uh, Value Chain Coordinator who'll talk more about that. And I would like to continue that project and somehow pull that together better, but that's out there. Also, we have a farmer's market toolkit within our internal site of Extension. And if you reach out to your Extension office, you can access those materials. And they include things like this brochure about using your EBT card at the farmer's market, because folks might not know how to do that. And we want to uh, encourage them to spend their money locally. And then, um, we have um, farmer's market uh, nutrition benefit programs. And our um, our Kentucky, our food <laughs> systems team, lovely Jan and Bethany, at um, my coworkers at NEP, are the context, contacts related to this, um, just to help get you connected to those benefit programs. If you need some extra information, and we've got a few uh, pamphlets here too, it just gives overview about accepting uh, food benefits at the farmer's market, the types of benefits that could be accepted, um, and how to get started with those. So that's something to look into. And lastly, I think that's lastly, yeah, lastly, about, about me. Folks always say extension is the best kept secret, right? And there's no reason for it to be the best kept secret. I grew up in Glasgow, Kentucky, Barron County, born and raised, several generations. Had never heard about extension until I was working with the First Steps program and was like, that's a job? It makes no sense because I grew up in that community, in the poorest neighborhood in that community, off of McKenna Street. Um, and I grew up hungry. And I'm, I'm okay with saying that. And hunger doesn't look like your belly aching, right? Or it, it looks like that. But my mom never starved me, and she always had a hot meal. Hunger is bigger than that. It also is about the type of food that you are putting into your body. So that's what we want to encourage folks to eat local food and eat the healthiest that they can so they're not hungry, right? We want folks to get the best that they can. So that's a bit about me. Um, and if you have any questions about resources and marketing and, and nutrition resources, please reach out to your Extension office and the NEP. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, if on your list, you know how you have all the existing things, is there a link for like, you know, can farmers submit their information? Y'all have a page where the farmers are in the aerials or somewhere? We have a farmer's market like database, but not a farmer database. Okay. You try and make more work. I when you work with the wildlife and when you get recipe in some areas, did you feel like that that was some of the meats was a market that people were tapping into in their area? Because could they utilize and say you're not an area where you're privy to, you know, run to the store, like you said, pets of oil and other options of meat. I think it is an untapped market because I think people aren't exposed to it. And part of my exposure to that and exposing others to that is to make that another food option. Okay. Like to make it not so, because it tasted delicious. I'm not lying. But the issue is I couldn't eat much of it because, girl. I know it's your mind thing. It's the mind um, thing. But, oh, it was really the most tender. And we made squirrel dumplings. So it was super tender, super flavorful. But squirrel. And like, I couldn't move past that, but part of introducing folks to that, and that is an untapped market, is making it okay. It's squirrel's fine, it's just me. Yeah, I have a question. What's that? So in doing the untapped market, what do you, what do you run into as far as re yeah, regulations and things like that? Because me as, me as a farmer, I can go out and take my bow and kill, you know, bandy, and it's okay, because it's put into the team. But if I want to then have I guess that would be a question for brain or like uh or like I because I, I think that you would have to go through the same as your home-based processing situation and I don't know if you can home-based process soup I don't think so so you wouldn't be able to sell that necessarily this is just another option 
for folks to get secure local food on their own, most likely. You might not be able to sell that. So how do you get local food? You would offer the vegetables to go with the squirrel. <laughs> I don't know. Or like the a sample tray. Oh, a sample tray? That would be I would give it to your extension office. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Yeah, but you would like do the vegetables to go with the squirrel to complement the squirrel. That's what I would think. And that would not be a question for me. That's out of my scope. Well, just thinking about it more so in like a uh, food security piece rather than like selling. Well, I mean, the food security also because I want to deliver to the food that right and part of why we do this too is because the food banks were receiving donations of venisons and wild game mm -hmm. and then folks were getting that and they didn't know how to use it so this is why we went down this road of getting back to my question is how would it be how would the food bank able to receive it what what regulation did that person have to bring into that food bank Oh, they, they changed the legislation back in during COVID, I believe. Oh, but okay. that's I might have another fight over there. Um, so I don't know one hundred percent off my head as far as custom processing or self processing. I think you can do it as long as it's not crossing the state line. Okay. And I do have a memo that can tell you the exact answer. Um, but if you want to sell it then you will have to still have what you expected. Depending on the specific wild game, they're, they're categorized. So some, they'll let you be state inspected, and then you can <laughs> sell it as commercial within the state. And then others, they'll push it to USDA inspection, but you can still sell it. Thank you. A lot of your uh, doctor donated to the Kentucky Hunters for the Hungry. Mm -hmm. They will pay for the process. So if you do harvest deer, and that's part of our partnership with these recipe cards too, because they were getting that done, and then people were like, "What?" And is it only venison, or do you all do everything? I think Hunters for the Hungry will also take other types of wild game that you have to contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they get to decide, like, if they have a specific area in mind that they would like for that meat to be delivered to, do, do they do stuff of that nature, or does it just kind of go into a... I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Uh, I, I, they're pretty flexible, both. And they have processors all across the state yeah. that participate. So um, it's I think they'll deliver where you would request. If you wanted it to stay in your community or in a specific community, I think you could have it like that. Any other nutrition related questions? <laughs> <laughs> or marketing? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lean meat and high in protein. <laughs> yeah, it's very nutritious. Very nutritious. It's a little fatty, yeah. Excuse me, um, it, it was maybe sage in that because it was like a different type of flavor of of dumpling than I had had. It was more like uh, the flavors of kind of like sausage. So like say with this, it was really good. Um, and we have we're work still working on finalizing those recipes because we in all the recipes that we write, we like taste them and test them and final and like. The, we have a dietitian on staff at the state level and they have to make sure they're within our dietary guidelines. So we're still working on them. But it was like a no sage because I was like, this is different, but it was all right. Like, I, but it, uh, I'm working on it. What was the process of the meat? Wait, the, 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 um, the young lady was with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. She came with her squirrel and doves in hand <laughs> and, um, and little bodies. And she, uh, she cut them up and then she like boiled them, you know, because we were cooking it down and then they took the meat off the frame mm -hmm. and then they, um, that meat was reincorporated back into the dumplings, just like you would like, you know, chicken dumplings. They made like a broth, they cooked it, you know. All right. I'll talk about food all day long. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, everyone. I am Casey Hillard. Um, I'm over the LFS program for the um, Kentucky Department of Agriculture. So LFS is Local Food for Schools. Um, right now, we have a $3.2 million grant from the USDA. Um, and what we've been doing with that money is uh, take, we've, hold on, let me switch it to your next one. We've got 89 districts of schools all over Kentucky participating in this grant. Um, they have been given their money. Uh, they have until April of this coming year to use all of these funds. Uh, so far, we've spent about half a million dollars. Uh, they can only buy minimally processed and non-processed food, food from our uh, farmers. Um, the mileage between the farm and the school is within 400 miles. So that covers all of Kentucky, goes a little outside of Kentucky. Um, they have been loving their local products. We've um, had lots of beef, lots of, um, you can see our corn up there. That was from a local farmer. Um, we've had tomatoes, cucumbers, chicken uh, being in schools. So we've had so many things um, in our schools and kids are just loving it. Um, so this program um, helps establish new relationships between our producers and our food service directors. So our schools, um, I mean, that is a huge market for us as farmers, um, and it's it's going to be there forever. So our uh, kids are hungry, and we do want to um, give them local products for them to have for those meals. So our progress so far, um, so our farmers got this, um, or this grant was available to them early this year. So far, 46 participating farms has been able to participate and sell to our schools. Uh, 35 districts, districts out of those 89s have bought from farmers. And then over, well, 400,000 was a few months ago, but it's over half a million out of that 3.2 million right now um, that we've spent with local farmers. So here are some great pictures from Union County Schools. So we had um, cantaloupe, we had some watermelon. Uh, this is their salad bar. All Everything from the salad bar was local. Um, that is the food service directors having to cut up that watermelon in the schools. Uh, sometimes farmers are able to come into the schools and teach those food service directors how to use their products. Um, we had grapes in there. We had broccoli. We've had fresh cucumbers. Um, and then these schools are also able to take their fresh products and kind of process that into more once it's into the schools. Uh, we've got some uh, quotes up here. Uh, those cantaloupes look so good. Are they ever at the farmer's market? So this was off of Facebook from Union County Schools. Uh, one of those parents were able to take um, that, what their kids were having for lunch and being able to go to the farmer's market and then buying from that farmer there too. So that was really cool. So this was LaRue County Schools. They have an FFA program um, going on there. Uh, they are, these are a food service director and two of their kids. Um, they have done all that lettuce themselves. So that is really cool. And that um, school is able to buy from the local FFA organization there. So here is Henry County Schools. Um, we've got the food service director up there in the corner with the local farmer. Um, she was able to buy corn from her and she turned it into street corn. Um, so the kids love that corn on the cob. Um, she was able to say, um, have local produce. Um, they, those are her food service um, staff actually shucking that corn. Um, I don't know if how they felt about that, but it was a great experience for them to learn. Um, but I, I love that picture. That is so cool um, that they got that fresh corn in that. Um, we've got some berries there from a new farm, Stepping Stone Farm. Um, so that was really cool also. So this just lots of local products in schools right now that is really good for these students. So uh, like I said, I'm over LFS, uh, Local Food for Schools grant, and then I'm over another new to farm to school grant uh, that involves schools with their FFA programs. So if you are a farmer and interested in selling to schools, um, these schools have this money through the end of April, are buying at retail cost, and would love to get you signed up for this program. So just talk to me after. I've got business cards, and you can always uh, reach out and see if your local school is participating in that.
Yes, so we had $3.2 million that was given to us. We've got to the end of next April or this coming April. Um, this is really new to food service directors buying local. So they've only spent about 500,000. Um, they can buy any kind of minimally non-processed foods. And then we're also trying to get more beef and chicken, which um, it's a little hard for them to tran transition into doing that, bringing raw product into their school. So mm -hmm. it's very new to them. Um, it's new to farmers wanting or being able to sell that big to schools. So we're still working on, you know, implementing this into schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So we deliver to each individual or they deliver to like the central, you know, board of education and the manager of some schools might give it up five thousand. Yeah, so it's different for every county. Um, I know some counties are way too big for one farmer to deliver to every school. So um one farmer may deliver it to all the high schools and then those Food service staff will be able to deliver it to all the other schools or um, some farmers if you're able to do it to all the schools they'll do that so it's different for every farmer um, and food service director um, I know that LFS our grant does cover the delivery costs so if you want to charge delivery as a farmer uh, that would work um, I mean they have to pay for delivery through their other ways of getting food too so you as a farmer could do that also so how does a farmer that sign up? Do they contact you or they contact your local school? Or? Yes, so you could reach out to me or the local school. Um, everyone who is participating in this program, only 89 districts are, um, but everyone who is participating is looking for more farmers. Um, but the way you sign up, um, you can get on my master list, and that is on our website, um, kyagr.com, under the Farm to School page. Um, signing up. You don't really have to be Kentucky proud. You don't have to have any certifications or any uh, special trainings or anything. So all you have to do is talk with that food service director, tell them what you have. They tell you what they want. Um, they probably will get you signed up as a vendor and then you will make that purchase. Okay. So the sign up on Bonnie P, then um, they go to whatever school is within that area. And start the process from there. Yes. So it's not, um, I'm not purchasing it uh, like Lindsay is. Um, the school is directly purchasing it from the farmer. So that you just need your information and your database. Yes. Okay. And then if I see a new farmer come in or I know of a new farmer, I will reach out to the schools all around them. Um, and then I can give you a list as a farmer of all the participating schools we have also. Um, they're pretty open right now. We're looking for any kind of winter production. Um, you know, they've got a lot of money to spend. We're looking for any kind of uh, beef. They really love beef. So if you have any kind of beef, um, chicken is very new. Uh, they don't like to bring a lot of raw chicken in, but chicken is allowable, pork is allowable. Um, so if you have anything between now and April, that would be really good to reach out. Yes. No, um, one of our independent schools in Hart County, though, okay. yes, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. they are in it, but Hart County Schools is not. Yeah. yeah, and then we do have so many funds that we are allowing um, new schools to enter in late. So if you do know a farmer who would want to talk to a director about signing up, we are going to be reallocating some of that money. So does it only have to be funds? Let's say for organization and they want they got they want to go to farmers could they sign up as a participate in the program or do you have to actually be farmer organization um or other organizations that are saying like what yeah Brandon and I had a business we just saying that we got a bunch of vegetables and farmers but we we call you yeah so they are able to buy through like some of them have been buying through what chefs want um, but we do have to know exactly what farms or where um, within that mileage where it's coming from. So if you can provide that to the food service director who's buying so they could report that to me, that would be. So co-ops are allowed. And this is one you know where the farms are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So just within 400 miles of the school and the farm. Yeah. Yes. So we are really farm. 
they were simply down and not a living in the state on food. No, I do not believe so. We were building a farm. We were trying to contact you to get our stuff and even local here. Yeah, yeah. You can sell to a different county. And um, if you're willing to drive it over there or if the food service director willing to pay that delivery fee, yes, you can sell to other counties. It doesn't just have to be within your county. And like I said, we are reallocating this money. So if you want to reach out to Christian County, feel free to. And if they do want to sign up, then I do have. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Never no, um, and I mean, it's a high turnover job. Some of them just have their priorities in different places or they're not, um, they're uncomfortable with it because they've never purchased local before. Um, sometimes they get products that don't meet their standards or um, it's not, it's got some dirt on it and things you would buy from a bigger place would not have dirt on it. Um, there's just many reasons why they would not or they just yeah. Yeah. I would argue that it's not reason to just be serious. That's yeah. one of the yeah. things we're trying to change with this program is to try to make it this isn't we're, we're trying to change the paradigm from you know, a person centered, well, this food service director buys local, but this one doesn't, to more no, it's schools in Kentucky buy the local. But that's a long process. Mm -hmm. Um this is a, one of the programs that's helping us take that mindset. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, everything from equipment to a lot of these schools went to kind of food serve models a, a decade ago yeah. because yeah. they couldn't get the right people uh, in positions to actually put the raw ingredients. And so now they don't have the ability to take local product and turn it into food. And so we have to change those uh, methods and paradigms, and we got to get the equipment into the kitchens, and we got to get people trained up again. It's a big partnership. We work a lot with UK. Uh, we work a lot with Kate and me to try to make that happen. So I don't know why Christian County turned it down. Um, we, we have those conversations. Oh, no, you did great. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, Kate, you may want to stay up there as well. Um, it, there may be another slide on yours. Here we go, forward or backward? Ah. Well, my name is Tina Garland, and I am a branch manager um, under Mr. Ian Hester. Uh, he's their director in the foods division, and my branch covers um, farm to school, chefs in schools, junior chefs, seniors farmers market, and then we have our LFS brand, and we just recently was awarded um, the USDA farm to school grant, where we had written um, for six schools to team with their FFA department and um, submit applications, then the FFA department, uh, upon award, the FFA department would get right at $27,000 to spend on high tunnel greenhouse or any type of equipment or anything that they need to grow to sell to the food service directors. And the food service directors would... Um, kind of target their money for food storage, which would be either a freezer or a walk-in cooler and or both. And like Ian mentioned a minute ago, a lot of the problem problem or challenge is food storage, you know, because they didn't have, or they do not have the storage to hold, you know, something fresh coming in. Uh, I can remember, I started with farm to school. Oh, because they're, so they can hear you on Zoom. Oh. oh. I can remember I started uh, with farm to school in 2010 and if when we came in saying beef or poultry or anything raw the food service directors would just fall out on the floor I mean they were like no no raw product in our kitchen and I was thinking, why, you know, 
Um, but that all changed. And so like Ian was saying too, you know, the shift is there and that's so exciting because, and something else that's, that's exciting to me is I've worked with, uh, or our team has worked with almost every one of your all's programs within this room and K-Card, oh my, you all are the best kept secrets. <laughs> and so is extension. And I mean, it's just it's amazing how what we have to offer and these meetings such as what we're doing today is really nice because even we, we get in our own, you know, it's not that we get in our own silo. We just get so focused on what we have to do. And in the time limit, we have to do it. Sometimes we forget, Oh, that's right. You know, just like the, the, um, Kentucky Office of Ag Policy, you know, those, those loans, that's huge for a young farmer and a beginning farmer. So I'm, ex I'm excited that we're here doing this today, but I talk about squirrels. I am a squirrel. I'll get off. <laughs> I'll get off topic, but I will tell you a cute little funny story. One of our, I had never had squirrel and I do fix a lot of chickens and dumplings. And one of um, our friends said, hey, you know, do you mind if I squirrel hunt? And I said, no, not at all. He said, you know, your daddy used to let me. I said, fine. This was right after my dad passed. And I said, you go on. Sometimes when you get extra, I would like to try one. Well, one night I was at home by myself and we lived down the dead end road and this car comes down the driveway. The dogs go crazy and the horn starts hon honking. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what is going on? So I peek my head out the door and this guy, this car that I didn't recognize held this bag out the window and he said I got your squirrel and I was like what and he said I got your squirrel and then it finally took me a minute and I said oh okay so I went out thanked him you know brought it back in he had cleaned it he had done everything for me hallelujah and then I looked at it and I, I opened the bag and when I poured it out I thought oh I, I don't know how I'm gonna feed this to my family because it looked like a little squirrel you know squirrel arms you know <laughs> I was like oh my gosh they are not gonna eat these little squirrel arms so um called another friend of mine and said what in the world am I going to do with this squirrel <laughs> and so they said have you tried squirrel and dumplings I said nope they said fix it just like chicken and dumplings I said I can do that so I boiled my little squirrel and then picked all that meat off and I had made my dumplings and put it in kids came in after they were in high school and middle school and they came in after ball practice plop 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 you know I put everybody's chicken and dumplings um, <laughs> on their plates <laughs> And they ate and they ate and they ate. And then I said, How'd you like the squirrel? <laughs> they were like, No. Oh, it was so funny. But what? <laughs> I, mean, I was like, There it is. <laughs> so, anyway, it was funny. Oh, gosh. I don't even know if I've covered my first slide, guys. <laughs> and I can't even see. Uh, did I? Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's what I love about, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that. Casey, can you help me? What did I do wrong? Oh, okay. All right. So, um, farm to school, um, the first steps uh, for you as a producer. Can I see hands in here? How many is a producer? Awesome. Okay. All right. Um, well, let me ask you and you guys back there. Have you worked with farm to school before? Have you worked? Have you? Okay. We tried. We reached out to four different districts. Uh -huh. None of them was interested or they didn't get back to school. What product do you have? Beef and pork. Beef and pork. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And what? Monroe, Mar Barron, Allen, and Warren. Okay. Warren. Yeah, she didn't email me back either. Okay. You were... Um, okay, I start to say you were <laughs> we're conversation, but um, give me your name and number before we. Or, I think I'm on the list, but I'll come talk to you. Yeah, come talk to me, and um, because we'll make some connections for you. Um, but and what do you guys have or sell? Vegetables. Okay, have you worked with farm to school before? No. Oh, well, this is great. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Yeah, schools like that. Um, so really for your farmer steps, um, your 
you know, contact your local food service director um, and find out what they need, what they want. Um, and then um, if you have any food safety questions or anything, you can go through our um, food safety division. I know UK has a good food safety division as well. And then to provide the food service directors with any type of certificates that you have, like your PBPT training um, or your PSA training certificate, uh, take them a W-9 and a proof of liability insurance. Uh, they will need these things to put you into their system so that they can start paying you. Um, the third thing you need to do is stay in communication with that food service director. Um, you know, should you have trouble with an order, you know, contact them ASAP. Um, I heard Lindsay say, and I've heard other people say throughout their presentation, it's communication and it is relationship. So communication and relationship is huge. And believe you me, that food service director, if you call them and say, you know, something happened to all of my tomato crop and um, or tomato harvest, and I'm not gonna be able to get you that harvest this week like we had planned. They are not gonna take your firstborn child because I've tried to give them mine and they wouldn't. Sure. So <laughs> um, they just want you to communicate because they have the luxury of kind of pulling up and ordering from their prime vendor, which would be uh, a Gordon's GFS, um, who else, um, what chefs want, and DOD. They have that luxury of doing that. So again, communication is the key to build those relationships because after Casey and Lindsay's grant ends, we want the relationship to be there so that these farmers are gonna continue selling to these schools. So, um, and review the payment and delivery schedule with your food service directors. Make sure that all the invoices uh, include your contact information, name, address, school delivery instruction, amount, cost, date, all that signature line from uh, for delivery, uh, and then begin filling your farm to school orders. So, um, you want to be able to talk with them about a delivery system. You know, do they want it at every school that they have? Will they help you deliver? And you go to three of their, two or three of their prom schools, and then they deliver out from there. You know, how do they want it? Because farm to school is not a cookie cutter. It is, it is, it's really custom. It's customized to what that school and that food service director wants. And you've got to, you know, one of the questions was earlier, you know, why wouldn't they purchase that? Why wouldn't they, um, you know, start ordering from us? Well, when you go from a system that gets everything inside their, inside their delivery walls, inside their walls, that's already washed, cut, cooked, bagged, diced, sliced, you know, why would you bring a product in that needs to be washed, cooked, diced, sliced, you know, why would you do that? Um, and, but we have, with these type grants, it's provided us the opportunity. We have the Chefs in Schools program and Rebecca Shepard Smith does a wonderful job going into our schools and working with their staff, showing them how to prepare uh, looking at their overall kitchen and, and saying, you know, this would work better, you know, this way or on the line presentation, or they may have a piece of equipment. We've seen a lot of times the schools have a piece of equipment sitting in the back corner that they've not utilized, or may, they may be using a piece of equipment only to this degree of its ability, you know, so that program has been excellent for us. So follow those four steps. I'm going to try that, Casey. Ah, and there's Casey. <laughs> there's Casey's information if you need that. And I think my information does follow hers. But that's, the, that's kind of our, we have about um, 88 school districts that are regularly participating in farm to school. Uh, Ian, how many school districts do we have? A hundred and... 
was it 160 something? I was thinking it was 168 or 169. We have about 169 um, school districts across the state of Kentucky. And we have 88 that are participating pretty regularly in farm to school. We've impacted, um, gosh, thousands and thousands of students. Junior Chef um, takes it a kind of a step further. It teaches kids um, or it gives the high school students the opportunity to develop a recipe that fits for farm to school that can be served in the cafeteria that's kid tasted, kid approved, and then they uh, compete. And Sullivan University is our partner with that. And there's been over a million dollars that Sullivan University has provided to our students and the program um, Junior Chef got such notoriety that USDA has made it a program within the Southeast region. So USDA now has a Southeast region competition. And so our Southeast region states compete and we will be competing in May um, for another scholarship for our Kentucky students. So it's really exciting. I love the teamwork. I love how everybody comes together and however we can help you all with Farm to School and the Farm to School Hub, we need to get back on that because the uh, Jackie and Jackie and I, when we were working on that, it is a great concept. Yes, has great potential, but we need to get it back out there. So um, however we can help at the department, we're happy to do so. So any questions for Casey and I or the rest of our team, Ian or Lindsay? All right. Well, thank you for having us, and we'll be over in this direction. Hi, everybody. My name is Dakota Moore. I'm with the Kentucky Horticulture Council. So we are a uh, organization made up of, uh, well, our board is made up of members of other organizations in the state, all related to horticulture. So the Kentucky Vegetable Growers Association, uh, the Kentucky Vegetable Growers Association, the uh, Kentucky Horticulture, uh, State Horticultural Society, uh, Oak, the Organic uh, Grower, or the Kentucky, Organic Association of Kentucky, sorry. Uh, uh, but we've got about like uh, 18 to 20 member organizations that make up the Horticulture Council. So we exist to serve those organizations by implementing educational programs, grant programs. Um, we work with all these other organizations represented here today. So I'm going to share some information on a few of our programs uh, that I thought would be more applicable to, to people in this room today. Uh, so Sorry, the font is very small. I don't know why. Uh, so crop insurance education. I worked with uh, Marissa from KCARD. She's now going to be the executive director of Community Farm Alliance. But we did, uh, yeah, I don't know why it's, no. Well, I've, we might just have to, <laughs> Skip it. We'll let it go. Um, so crop insurance education. I uh, worked for a year to to learn all I could about crop insurance. Uh, and uh, that is best to serve specialty crop producers, so vegetable producers. Um, so we made about 25 webinars and uh, videos that are on YouTube that you can really dive deep into crop insurance. Um, I've got handouts and resources, but the most important part is if you have questions about crop insurance, I can help uh, walk you through the programs uh, that are either from the Farm Service Agency or the USDA uh, that might work best for you. And I've got some handouts here uh, that uh, will help you find what you need. And then I've got another handout that is all about these crop insurance uh, programs and policies. Um, there's money out there for uh, socially disadvantaged farmers that can help them uh, have lower premiums uh, on uh, especially the FSA programs. Um, so if 
if you are serious about protecting your future, because especially here in West Kentucky, how many disasters have we had recently? I mean, we had some yesterday. So it's very important if you're if you're uh, afraid of what might happen weather base uh, to your operations. Uh, crop insurance is not just for soybeans and corn anymore. It's they're implementing new policies every year and changing these policies to better serve farms. Uh, there's programs that are focused especially on people that are considered micro farms. And uh, some of our biggest horticultural farms in this state are probably still considered micro farms because when you compare it to large uh, livestock operations or large corn and soybean operations, but these programs have a lot less paperwork. So it, if you've ever heard of the paperwork involved in crop insurance, these are a lot less. Uh, and these specialty crop insurance programs uh, look at your revenue instead of your yield. So it says, this was my revenue last year. This was the revenue the year before and the year before. Uh, and I had a major loss. So I'm going to get a payment based on that. So it's a lot easier. So if you're really interested and, and want to talk about that, uh, I've got business cards or I can talk to you to afterward about that. I learned about this, so you don't have to. So uh, that's what we're here for. We learn about all the little details and then we kind of uh, make it where you can digest it easily. Eh, let's, oh no. There we go. Did we go ahead? No? Aha, uh -huh, we're here. Okay, so the Kentucky Ag Healthcare Trust. So this is uh, an easy way for you to get uh, health care for you and your employees. Uh, as long as you have two people employed by your farm, so it can be a husband and wife, it can be a, a mother-daughter, anything like that. Um, this is a way for you to get, I don't know, for you to get uh, health insurance. So there's, it's through Anthem, there's 20 different plans. All you have to do is be a member of one of the organizations that's a part of the Kentucky Horticulture Council. Um, those dues are very cheap, usually uh, maybe $40 max uh, for some of those. Some of them, it's it's very, very cheap. So you just have to be a member of one of those organizations. Yeah, yeah. So so we did just, I, I forgot to mention, we did just add the uh, Christmas Tree Growers Association as our newest uh, member organization. So we do cover everything. The Kentucky Florist Asso Association is a part of us. So a uh, florist might not be considered ag by people, but it, it technically is. Um, I worked in a flower shop for three years and I thought it was ag. So, um, so this is a program that we just facilitate uh, you to find some, uh, the contact for this program. Um, so if, you, if you've got two employees, uh, this would be a, a good way for you to have health insurance. It's really hard to retain good health uh, nowadays, especially for people in retail settings, uh, like a flower shop, like I worked at. Uh, the, one of the reasons why I left was healthcare. I didn't have any, so I, I needed to find a job that, that did. So this is a way that businesses like that uh, can have good health plans that has the the prices of a large business because it's basically combining a bunch of farms so they can purchase pretty easily so i've got a handout on that as well yeah i've, I've got handouts right here so afterwards come come pick these up um let's see what's next Oh, went too far. So uh, the ag water safety, I, I'm sure someone will be talking about produce safety in a bit, um, but this is another one of our programs. So I forgot my kits today, but we have water testing kits that uh, can walk you through taking a sample of your water. Uh, with the FISMA rules, uh, that's the Food and Safety Modernization Act, uh, you have to be testing your water if you're uh, using groundwater, so pond, creek, um, even a well, you want to make sure your well is safe, not just for your customers, but for you as well. So we can provide assistance with understanding uh, these water rules. Uh, if you're concerned about a water source you're using, uh, we can help walk you through some of the risk mitigation effects, because basically you want, to, you want to test to make sure there's no contaminants in your water that is then going to uh, cause your customers to be sick. 
Um, but we also can come out to your farm and test your water for you. Um, and you need about five tests a year to kind of set the baseline level uh, for your water source. So we can we, we can come out there and, and do that testing uh, for you, help you find a lab if you want to do it yourself. Uh, and I do have handouts on, on how to test your water as well. So uh, another one is the GAP certification program. So GAP is Good Agricultural Practice Certification. A lot of big buyers uh, require you to have this um, if you're selling to, oh, if you're selling to some schools might require it. I don't think too many do, but uh, some of the uh, bigger retail chains may require you to have this GAP certification. So we offer a third party uh, uh, audit uh, cost share. So up to 75% of your cost for this uh, gap audit, uh, it's up to $1,250. Um, and a part of this program, we work with Cultivate Kentucky. Um, and I'm I'm sure she's going to be up here to, to talk in a minute. Um, but so we will work with them. They'll help you prepare for this, this audit. Um, and then we help you cover 75% of the cost. The application is, is pretty easy. Uh, this is something not every farm is going to need. This is something if you're serious about selling to certain retailers um, or you know certain locations, uh, this is something you want to look at uh, you know down the line. Not, it's not a brand new farmer thing, but uh, we like to share this information now so you can keep it in mind uh, later on. So some of the other things we do, we do a lot of marketing assistance. Uh, so farmer's markets, I've gone to farmer's markets and talked to them about how to maybe set up better booths or uh, do better branding on your farms and the farm uh, overall. I don't know why it's why it's changing like that. It's just me. No, I, I don't have a clicker or anything. <laughs> So, so um, if you've got questions about your farmer's market booth or, or you know, branding yourself better either online uh, or in person at a market, uh, we can offer assistance with that. My coworker, Bethany, is great at social media. She, she films all these cooking videos for, for us. She uses the local products. Um, so she, she would be a great resource if you want to maybe uh, reach your customers better and make that connection. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, the Farm to School Network, Tina, uh, and then uh, uh, Community Farm Alliance, Lori White. So she took on the on the the reins of the Farm to School Network. So this is a network uh, basically to help answer some of those questions y'all had for for Tina, like where do I find uh, a person at a school to sell? Um, where do I, or you know, how do I get the the school to want to buy from me? So. Uh, we can work with with you to find a school to sell to, or we work with schools to find uh, farmers to fill. Uh, and with that, the local uh, food for school program, what I've heard from uh, food service directors is they're having trouble finding farms. So that's what all of us here are, are there to do is to help you find a school to sell at. Uh, and then our cut flower promotion, if you're interested in, in cut flowers, we've built a network of over 130 cut flower farmers here in the state. Uh, so we worked with, with those farmers to make sure it's a lasting commodity here in the state. I think it's got the power to do so. Um, and it's, uh, it's growing year after year. So four years ago, we knew of 60 farms and now we've doubled that and, and beyond. Uh, and then I wanna plug our farm to school or our Kentucky Fruit and Vegetable Conference that's coming up in Bowling Green. So Closer than Lexington. So <laughs> it is West Kentucky, uh, if you ask people that don't live in West Kentucky. Um, but it's it's not too far from here. So it's January 3rd and 4th. That's a Wednesday and a Thursday. If you buy your tickets and register by next Friday, the 22nd, it's only $50 for both days. You get lunch both days as well. So uh, just $50. If you... So the pre-conference workshops are on the second, two, uh, that's a Tuesday. Those are free. Um, we we do ask that you want to attend the rest of the conference, but if you want to just come for one of those, you're you're welcome to. But those pre-conference workshops, one is going to be, be on a farm food safety plan. So if, if 
uh, you've got some of these certifications you need to apply for, this is, would be a great a great two hour, I believe, course to sit sit in on. Um, there's a, a a farmer's market short course and a bringing the farm to school uh, uh, workshop as well. So those are the pre-conference things. Uh, the conference uh, days, those are uh, anything you can think of, large fr uh, or small fruits, tree fruits, uh, vegetables. Uh, there's a beginning farmer track. There's uh, an urban farming track. There's a, uh, yeah, small scale. That's the word I was looking for. Urban and small scale track. Um, so it's and then a whole day of cut flowers. If you're really into cut flowers, we've got another uh, full day of cut flower stuff. Last year was our first year doing the cut flowers at the conference. And we had uh, about 80 to 90 farmers uh, come for that. So that was that was great. Um, but if there's anything you're looking for that you need help with, or you think this would, uh, I've got an idea that would be a good program, or people in my network need help with this, that's what we're here for. And so hopefully we can then find grants or projects that would work for that. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So we haven't been talking about the um, what about uh, the hospitals and the nursing homes? Um, places that are also regulated, you know, by federal funds. Or is that just not something that this is geared towards? Is it just that you have a government target? Or what is it? Like I said, we have a couple of hospitals here locally that. From my understanding, <laughs> most of the time they'll do their own purchasing. I don't know. Brandy might have a better answer for that. But, but Brandy and the people, people at, at Food Connection, that's that's what they would be able to help you with. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we have so many grants and programs going on. These were just some that I thought I would mention. Uh, but yeah, check out our website and our YouTube. We do lots of videos and, and help. Yeah, social media as well. Um, so yeah, we're constantly getting new grants. So if there's something you think, hey, we need to focus, you mentioned microgreens, that's something I would be interested in in finding something that we could do at either education or grant-wise. So we we constantly are looking for new ideas that we can pursue that will hopefully serve everybody uh, that we can. Okay. Yeah. Afternoon. Hey. Uh, Trevor Claiborne, real quick. I'm the uh, DFAP case manager for Kentucky Dis Discrimination Financial Assistance Program. Uh, we'll come. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, here to update. I think most people in here are aware of the Discrimination Financial Assistance Program, DFAP. So the extension of uh, the Deadline has been extended to January 13th. This is $2.2 billion for anybody in Kentucky that is this, uh, witness this, uh, can prove discrimination from either the USDA or FSA office in the loan process. Uh, this isn't reparations or anything. It isn't, uh, this is a one-time financial assistance program. It covers women, it covers minorities, uh, covers veterans. And so we want some Kentucky producers to get a part of this $2.2 billion. Uh, you can go to apply.gov, 2207, apply.gov. If you want information, we also provide technical assistance at the Kentucky office at 107 West Loudon in Lexington. So if anybody had any questions for me today, uh, feel free. I have my little yellow badge on. Or like I said, you can check us out online. And we also have some handbills up here. Do you have any producers also in your networks that may uh, qualify for this? We definitely welcome you to reach out to us. And we're here to provide free technical assistance. It's like a one time. This is one time. It's one time if anybody's experienced discrimination before January 2021. Which is $2.2 billion. It has been extended to January 13th for the deadline. The application takes about an hour and a half to fill out. Uh, it is a free service that the USDA has provided. And so that's what our office provides, technical assistance. Uh, it looks like a lengthy application, but it's really not as lengthy as it looks. But uh, the USDA wants to be very concise 
about the producers laying out their claim. Uh, this is, and maybe I felt discriminated against. You have to really be able to identify what has happened, timeline, not maybe. I, it has to be very concise, but this is opportunity for some Kentucky farmers to get some financial assistance. It's the clarity across the board. So uh -huh. let's say anybody in general would have met in favor of the FSA office and let's say they would have been in the state. I want to do something that they didn't feel, FSA office didn't feel that would be applicable to them to apply to. Would that be considered discrimination? Or if, let's say, because when I was in DC, it was issues with organic farmers. They didn't, if they say that they're like, you know, their programs met their needs, so they discouraged them from filling out information or applications to be a part of the program. I mean, my question is is the broad spectrum or the specific things to stand out? Specific. It, it, there's a question on there where it asks, when did you know that there was discrimination? We're not dealing with feelings. <laughs> Right. Like, oh, I felt that this person looked at me funny. If you can't document it, the date, I did my due diligence as a producer seeking so this they, loan. They returned right away several times just because of that whomever was was in that office and returned away, not based on appearance, but what they thought of the individual. Would that be considered discrimination? You have to be able to prove it. Okay. And so there are guidelines of was it race, was it sex, age? veteran status, ethnicity. Uh, we have had some people come in for age. Uh, there was a young, uh, there was a gentleman who said he had filled out an application back in the 90s. He didn't get it because he was fresh out of high school. So he felt, felt like it might be age, but you do have to be able to be concise in proving that, well, somebody else of, of another age group was able to get it and I wasn't. And so this, uh, like I said, you're dealing with the USDA, so you don't want to go in with feelings. Right. But this is opportunity if you can uh, prove your case. Now, a few years ago, they had something similar where people could get uh, a settlement was made. Debt relief? You talking uh, about paper? No, like so, something similar to what it is now. So if some farmers were awarded at that time, and they felt that they were turned away from the USDA due to like the age or anything, it was a point of the same thing, similar cause. Would they be able to apply for that as well? Yes. Okay. But on your application, so you do have to you do have to make that note that you have applied for others because it will make a difference in how much is allotted in the case that you are awarded. Okay. Can you give us an example of what what proof is? I've had some farmers reach out to me and say, "Well, I don't have like the that the piece of paper that said I was declined." So in a part of the application, so you can't have a third party who's not a family member. So you can't have a family member that uh, saw this process, but possibly a bank, possibly a, an agent that might have helped you to uh, fill out the application. Somebody other than a family member that can uh, write down a few paragraphs, uh, being able to detail what they witnessed. So it does uh, FSA, so it's, it's kind of over for the window for FSA. That was over November the 4th to get any sort of documentation from FSA, but you can't have third party uh, accounts. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. And I, I will say a lot of people have, I ain't gonna say a lot of people, there's been people who, who may have qualified that were turned off by the word discrimination. It covers a wide range of people. It covers a wide range of people. And so, like I said, gender, age, uh, Native American status. And so it's $2.2 billion. It's going to go somewhere. So we want to make sure somebody in Kentucky gets some of it. So it's socioeconomic status too? You have to be able to prove that. Okay. Okay. But uh, on the application, it does, and I do have some applications with me if anybody's interested to kind of look through. It does identify the specific areas to de uh, determine if there was discrimination. I think the most difficult aspect is, let's say, some people are just continuously discouraged. They don't have any documentation. What do you agree about, you know, discouragement? You don't have that information. So. There, so I, I can tell you, divulging, there's about 8,000 applications so far nationally. 
The key word is quality. So I'm not privy to say how many are actually going to go through. Uh, unfortunately, some people have put it out. Oh, he, uh, he's going to sign up for $500,000. That's not what this is. Mm -hmm. That's the most that can be awarded based on how many people apply. On average, it's not going to be nowhere near 500000 But it, it once again, it depends on how many people apply. It's not a first come, first service. Literally, can you lay out your claim? Uh, it does have a section where you identify the people that you work with in this office. And I think that's kind of thrown some people off as well. Yes. And so uh, the opportunity is there. Uh, once again, we do, uh, we're here to help with technical assistance, scanning of documents. Uh, we've been able to walk through it with a lot of people just walking through the application. It seems wordy, but it, it is uh, rather simple. Mm -hmm. With some form of documentation services, you work with the office today, like email. Uh, email, email threads. Uh, what day did you first reach out? How long did it take for somebody to respond? That partly, but then you'd also have to have somebody to bear at least two or three other people to verify, okay, it didn't take me this long in this process. So you can't say, well, I felt like they took too long to get back to me and say that was discrimination. You would have to be able to compare it, uh, have precedence with another situation. Does that make sense? Public record, but then you would also need somebody's test, like somebody would have to have a written statement that, yeah, I, I filled this uh, application out, or I reached out to this office, this was the time it took to get a response. And the deadline is January 13th to apply. How far back does it go? Anytime before January 2021. Uh, as most of us have worked with farmers, a lot of farmers aren't necessarily keeping records online, so it would be based on hard copies, notes, which does complicate it, but uh, anything of value is probably going to be complicated. Uh, we've had some people there, uh, their local banks have, have come through and verified that they had. Uh, situation. So it really, uh, a lot of it's based on relationships who you can get as a third party to verify in the situation where it dates back, you know, before computers or emails. So one thing you can always do is maybe get a off good receipt for service. Uh, I know that uh, you can go in and have everything be documentation or whatever you do. And unfortunately, I think she made the case about extension, the great secret. There's a lot of opportunity that people just aren't aware about something as simple as getting a receipt. People, a lot of people don't think about that. And so it puts us in a situation where, hey, you know, if you don't have any paper or documentation, it's your word against whoever you're uh, making this claim against. And so that's definitely, I think, something that could be promoted for this uh, document. So let me get back to kind of what we were talking about earlier. You've got so many different government agencies, and which one does does this thing? I, I think always, you know, getting the, the documentation back so you can follow through. And who, who am I waiting on to get back to me on this one? Different things. And so it's unfortunate that it is, this has happened, and uh, you can have the type of thing. So I, I can speak from uh, when that, some of that was on my watch. I used to run the Farm Service Agency in Kentucky. Up until January of 21. Uh, and, uh, and we were trained on all, all my team were, were application paper folks. I mean, that's the way my office works today. It is uh, we were, we were trained to take every application and then and then work it through. Uh, we do that. It should be all following back and forth. And sometimes you have to, sometimes you are told about it, it's credit. But it should be able to be documented why uh, that is being turned down. It's not credit worthy. You should have documentation. No problem about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank 
right. Everybody's getting tired by now. Um, I'm it. So you can take a deep breath. <laughs> It'll all be over in just a few minutes. But there's still plenty of coffee and snacks over there that I got for everybody this morning. And I don't want to have to take home. So make sure that you get good and jacked up on caffeine before you leave. Um, my name is Brandy Button Johnson, and I'm with the Food Connection at the University of Kentucky. And I'm the Western Kentucky Value Chain Coordinator. And um, most of you in this room probably have no idea what that is because it's a brand new thing that just started in May. Um, prior to that, I was the Executive Director of Sustainable Glasgow, which is a grassroots nonprofit in Glasgow, Kentucky, in Barron County, for almost 13 years um, as a the director of that, I helped with the Bounty of the Barrens Farmers Market. And Sustainable Glasgow's whole piece was promoting the local economy with agriculture. Barron County is a big ag county. Um, like he was saying, big burly tobacco producers. I grew up on a burly tobacco farm. My parents had to be part of the buyout in, I guess it, I was a freshman in high school. So I always said I would not be involved in agriculture and I would not raise my children on a farm and they would never have to go through that because my dad was evil for making us follow a setter at six years old. Um, and then the older I got, the more nostalgic I got and I got into social justice and it all just kept coming back to my daddy and what he made us do. <laughs> And I wanted to make a difference in the life of farmers that took that buyout and they didn't really have anything to supplement for it. So here I am. Um, the food connection at the University of Kentucky is where I found my new home. And I'm so humbled and happy in this new position because I didn't know what I was doing with Sustainable Glasgow was value chain coordination until I got hired in this position and did our training. And I was like, oh, that's what I've been doing this whole time. I just didn't know that's what it was called. Um, the Food Connection started because of a very unique position that UK Dining got in with Airmark, which is one of those large food service vendors that the, the lady back here was asking about with hospitals and that sort of thing. Um, when UK Dining's contract came back up to be fulfilled with Aramark, they decided, yeah, well, we will make a contract with Aramark, but we're going to ask for you all to do a few things. And so part of that was we want you to purchase from Kentucky growers and local producers and a certain percentage of what you all purchase has to come from our state's uh, producers. And because of that, that puts UK in a very unique situation because it allowed them to um, negotiate a, not only a contract with Aramark where certain percentage of the food that's brought on the UK campus has to be purchased from local producers, but also because it, they were like, we don't know how to do that. We want this contract, but we're really not sure about what that looks like or the staff that's involved or how that's negotiated. And so the food connection was created. Um, and the executive director there, Ashton Potter Wright, who is is my supervisor, uh, was in a position with Lexington in the mayor's office where she did the farm to table movement there and was a value chain coordinator in that movement. And so that put her in a unique position to be the executive director um, and has been in the position where she decided, you know what, there, it's not possible for one person to cover the entire state when it comes to purchasing local uh, and it doesn't make sense for somebody like me in central Kentucky to be contacting farmers in western and eastern Kentucky that don't know me or like have the background that I do. There should be somebody that lives there that is coordinating those efforts and going and talking with those farmers and making those connections. And she wrote a grant that funded three positions throughout the state. So there's the Western Kentucky Value Chain Coordinator who who's me and you all are stuck with, um, if you're in the 39 counties west of Metcalf County, which in my interview I argued I was, I did not live in Western Kentucky. I live in South Central Kentucky in Barron County. But according to the extension map, I am part of Western Kentucky. And then you have the Central Kentucky coordinator who's Faye Kuzman. And then we have an Eastern Kentucky coordinator who is Heather Graham. And I have everyone's contact information here 
Um, and the extension map kind of maps out those areas that are considered central, western, and eastern. And each of us live where we're covering. So like I said, I'm in Barron County. I work remotely in Barron County. Heather is in, um, she's in the Red River Gorge area. Is it Wolf County? Okay, that's awful. I don't even know what county it is. I've been there. I went to her house. It took me a lot longer than it does be. Get to Lexington, yeah. <laughs> and then Faye is in Woodford County. So we're all living where we are located. But what our main position, oh, I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, our main position as value chain coordinators is we want to have, we want to help our producers in our areas have a greater direct farm impact and getting them into mid to large uh, markets. So that looks like universities, hospitals, conference centers, um, some farm to school, some K through 12 schools, um, some some retail, but our main focus, because we have that leverage with UK Dining's Aramark contract, and the fact that most universities in Kentucky have Aramark contracts, um, we want to get in, our farmers into those mid to large scale markets. And that's kind of like our, our microscope, uh, you know, macro, we're, we're here to help in any way that we can. I'm never gonna tell a producer that reaches out to me uh, oh, I can't meet with you because you don't grow enough. Um, I will always meet with whoever it is that wants to meet with me and see where they are and what it is that their goals are and where I can match them. And that may look like what everybody's been talking in here today, which I love being a part of is like this big ag family. That may be me saying, you know what? I don't really see a place that I can match you with, but I do know that Casey has a grant for local food for schools and I can connect you with her and I can set up that meeting with you. And if you feel uncomfortable talking to her one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be happy to be in that meeting with you. And we can kind of like talk through it together. Or um, if it's what you need is something, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about Dakota's programs today. Uh, we were back, <laughs> Courtney and I were back there like, they have like, they figured out health insurance. Mm -hmm. Sweet, like that would have been nice. So. We, but we are here to connect you in any way that we can and build that relationship with our producers so that we know you well enough and what you have going on that what what benefits you the most. It's the relationships that matter to me. That's why I love my job. I was already, I already had plenty of relationships with farmers. I was raised by them. I was around them all the time with the market, but I always was like, what, what else can I do? Like, what can I help? to help them be better or do more or find the resources that they need. And so that's our position is to meet with you as a producer and say, okay, this is where you're at. Where do you want to be? And then start connecting the dots and connecting you with those relationships that we've built to get you into the places that you want to be. Uh, ultimately, if that is a mid to large scale market, then it is my job to do, like Dakota said, all the boring stuff that I'm learning more and more about uh, procurement and contracts and gap audits than I ever cared to know. But I've learned that stuff so that I can pass that on to the producer and mainly so I can do so in an accessible language because I want to be, if, if I am not helping someone understand, if, I don't feel like that I'm doing my job if I can't talk to a producer one-on-one -on -one and them understand all this stuff that's up in here uh, before I leave like if I'm not saying it in a way that they understand then we're going to back up and we're going to try it a different way so that they are well versed enough that they are able to advocate for themselves when they get into those situations um, whether it be a food service director that says no we don't want your beef we're good then I'm going to step in and be like hey but did you know <laughs> and and part of it is education you know so with like food service director in Barron County, when I first sat down, they're like, we just don't have the money. We'd like to do more. This is all we can do. And I'm like, you know what, but you have this local food for school grant that I know that you have. And I also know that, you know, if you're going to pay GFS, this GFS is a billion dollar company. They can take a loss. 
what you're doing is encouraging your FFA students that somebody here locally can sell to you and they can make a living and then it becomes an educational experience and it goes back into the local economy. And by the time I talk circles around her, she's like, oh, my, well, give me some options. And then I can put together those options based on what you have as a producer and we can meet each other in the middle. So it's not that Barron County Schools is going to do 100% local and that's all they're ever going to serve. But I may be able to convince them to do 10%. They may source 10% local and that's a huge impact on the farmers in that area versus 0%. Um, so I say that I build relationships and then I direct you to others. I help you where you are. I come to you. I can be your biggest cheerleader or I may be your dream crusher as Marissa Christie likes to call some of us affectionately, <laughs> because I may look at you and say, that's not going to work and you don't have near what you're going to have to have in order to serve a school system. But, but if you want to get to that point, then let's start with one thing that you do have that you have a lot of and see how much they'll purchase. And then if that goes over, well, let's see how you can scale up from there. Let's connect you with KCARD so that you can get your business plan in order so that you can apply for a grant to get that piece of equipment that you need so that you can then continue to scale up. Um, or let me connect you to our Cultivate Kentucky team <laughs> who Courtney is back there and she said, I'm not talking, you can talk for me. Um, but she will talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. She just doesn't wanna stand up here and be recorded. So they are a wonderful resource in our office because between herself and Brian Brady, they know all the ins and outs of all the boring stuff about food safety that is necessary in order for us to not get sick and in order for you all to get the certifications that you need as a producer. So she and Brian will do one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with you all to develop your food safety plan. Because if you're going to sell to a mid to large scale outlet, you have to have a food safety plan in place. And, and they know all the ins and outs of that. They have templates. They will work with you one-on-one -on -one until you get it in order. And then also with any type of mid to large scale outlet, not K through 12 schools in the state of Kentucky, it's actually um, K through 12 schools do not require a third party gap audit, which is a good avenue for certain producers. Um, but if you wanna get into a university or a hospital or an institution, something of that nature, most all of them are going to require some type of third-party gap audit for produce vendors. For protein, it's gonna be US, that USDA certification. And dairy, I love to say, just they're in their own, their own, own universe. So, but I have a great guy named Frank that I contact in the dairy universe that will tell me real quick, no, you can't do that. No, tell them they can't do that. Or if they want to do that, this is the only way they're going to be able to do that. So, um, but those university, those institutions, those are going to require that next level of certifications, gap audits, but we have resources that are free that are available that can help you with that. Courtney and Brian uh, are amazing. And right now there's a hundred percent success rate on the third party gap audits that they have helped producers with and preparing for. And um, so we work with you with them. We're, we're all partnering. So Courtney's gone with me to farms that I've visited to help them lay out what it is that they want to do. If they want to onboard with what chefs wants, she's there with me to kind of see where they need to be food safety wise. Um, and then we reach out to Dakota's office, ask for that piece of paper once they're ready to get that gap audit because they say, you know, I don't know if I can afford the gap audit, then we help that. Um, reach out to Taryn over at KCARD or Hannah there in the Western Kentucky area and say, look, they have it going on. They have a great product. They have got all of this, but they don't even have, they don't have a business plan. They know they want to do this next step, but they don't have a business plan. So we're the ones that are just kind of the soft tissue to say, let me meet with you. Let me see everything that you need. And then let me direct you where I can until we get you to where you want to be. And um, like the shoulder to cry on if you're the the type that doesn't want to talk to any of those people and don't want to do any of that stuff, then I'm 
on the phone and say, yes, I will drive to your farm because you don't know how to check email and I will set and I'll type it all in for you and we'll figure it out. And maybe, you know, once we get to a certain point, you can convince your daughter-in-law to check your email for you just once a week, just once a week. That's all we got to do. But figuring out those creative solutions to what helps our producers actually get to where they want to be instead of just kind of staying because they are too intimidated to, to go out there and put themselves out there. Um, I was trying to think the, if there's anything else I want to cover. Yes. Are requirements different? Like, so you said you you just do it through the hospital and long term care facilities. Are the requirements different for schools for large going to hospitals? I have not worked with a hospital as of yet. I know that our Eastern Kentucky coordinator is working with a um I, I don't know if it's a long term care facility or an actual hospital in Eastern Kentucky. But it's it very much depends on the buyer. So when we say buyer, we work with buyer, not just producers, but we work with buyers and distributors as well, so that we can have connections all along the food chain. Um, and so the buy it's very much buyer driven um, when it comes to institutions, especially if they have contracts with someone like a Cisco, Cisco or an Airmark or um, those major distributors and the. So I haven't worked with a hospital, um, but I can say that like, I worked with Sloan Convention Center in Bowling Green to discuss with them about uh, sourcing locally for the Fruit and Vegetable Conference. And their procurement system is completely different than Western Kentucky University's procurement system. So they're with a group called Atrium versus Western's with a group that's called um, Airmark. And it even gets down into such fun stuff as Aramark can purchase from what chefs wants up to a certain amount, but only for special events that are on campus. They can't, they're, they are only allowed up to a certain amount to purchase for food that's actually offered in their like WKU dining. But they can purchase unlimited amounts from Clem's distribution <laughs> If a producer is onboarded with Clem's distribution, they can they can purchase as much as they want from local producers onboarded with them. Or they can purchase from Cisco, but only the Cisco is not going to onboard. I shouldn't say not. I shouldn't say never, never say never. But pretty much the only way we're going to get into Cisco system is if we go another creative route through a place like Custom Food Solutions that is in Louisville where local producers can take a product and then it be made into a value added product like a soup um, or a sausage gravy. That's then UK dining orders a batch of that and it becomes a pallet load of this value added product that has local, um, locally grown items in it that then ship to Cisco's warehouse and the food service will order it from their Cisco catalog. <laughs> Whereas a conference center like Sloan's convention in their contract, it's different because what it says is they have to buy every bit of the food that they procure for their conferences through that system, except they get a 20% leeway like if they have a conference that wants coca-cola since their contracts with pepsi if they purchase coca-cola for that to to help out though that conference that that's attendees want that product there then that takes up a certain percentage of that little 20 percent wiggle room they get because they're not using their contracted vendor pepsi for that conference and that's all the stuff that i was like none of that was in my head and I didn't even think about it. I was always the one that was like, well, that's dumb. Why can't you just, <laughs> and then I had to learn real fast, like, well, there's all of these processes in place and contracts in place and all of these, you know. So that's a 
I was going to say, in my mind, I would have called those stumbling blocks. <laughs> um, there's all these little stumbling blocks in place where, you know, I feel like some people just get frustrated and they're like, oh, never mind. We're never going to be able to do this. And yeah, it's my job. And I uh, I was a future problem solver nerd uh, on the academic team when I was in middle school and high school. And I, I think this that was just like foresight into this position because now I'm like, oh, well, that's fun. Let's figure out a way to get around that. Oh, there's something else. Now we're going to back up. We're going to figure out a way to get around that. So, but it's knowing that information, like for me personally, uh, in my own life, do I need to know that stuff? No, I could care less, but I need to know that information in order to help farmers. I need to know that information in order to get local foods into the places that I feel like that they need to be. And I need to know that information well enough that I can then translate it to someone else or be able to figure out a way to get around it so that then I can let my farmers through that door and say, here you go. Like we figured out a way to get in. So then I, and the, the biggest joy is, you know, going back and forth with people like Sloan's convention about what they can and can't do. And then them saying, okay, we're going to use these four local producers. Here's our onboarding application. Will you send it to them? And then getting to send that to the producer and say, all you got to do is fill this out. And so like that, along with uh, hearing nutrition service directors say, well, we just had you 10 years ago, then we would have bought a lot more local because they don't have the staff or they don't have someone that just has, they don't have the time. A lot of people don't have time to think about the stuff, you know, that we're navigating and the reaching out to the resources that we have available. They don't have, you know, any clue like where to start. And so somebody like us makes it possible to say, well, if you want lettuce, then let me talk to, you know, the this this office at KDA about what kind of grants that, that they've got an extension. You can't afford it. Then I can talk to them. Tina was in a meeting with me and uh, Casey with Warren County Schools, who basically had decided they weren't a, they weren't going to buy local, and they had all these reasons not to, and especially because they had missed the deadline for the local food for schools grant. And once they talked to Casey and figured out that they may be able to get some more money, then when I met with them, they were on a Zoom with me in the office, and we were like, that and you know, there's every reason not to do it until you give them a reason to do it. And it's just like one thing, what's one thing that you could do in all your schools? And they're like, oh, we would do a vegetable, but nobody's going to drive to 22 schools. And guess what? I got a producer in Hancock County that said, I'll drive to 22 schools. I'm like, but it's in Warren County. He's like, I don't care. I'll drive to all 22 and I'll bring them down a sample, you know, like, so it's finding who's willing to do what matching. And it's like, it's, big, it's a big game you know, putting together the puzzle pieces. So, and that, that's, that's the best part is when you hear a producer text you and it's like, my, you know, my beef's going to be at the fruit and vegetable conference. Like, thank you so much. That's amazing. Or my, you know, corn on the cob is going to be in Logan County schools. And that's all because you wrote or what, you know, or we might be getting an automated bottler. Thank you so much. <laughs> so like, and that's, I mean, that, I think that's what each of our, us were hired to do in our area and know the area well enough to say, look, I don't need to go talk to them, but I know somebody else that should be the ones that go talk to them. If that makes any sense. Do y'all have any questions? I hope that I didn't, I ramble a lot. So. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you all so much uh, for coming out. Thank you to all the people that came to present. I really, really appreciate it because I learned a lot today. I don't, and now that we have, we have been recording it all. So hopefully we'll be able to share that with everyone um, and they can get it to producers that it'll be helpful for. So, and we need to thank Tanya, especially because she was the brainchild of this. Tanya and I are both from Park City, didn't know each other till I started this position, didn't know that we knew each other, yeah. um, and we were just talking on the phone, and she's like, you know, why 
Western Kentucky feels like nothing's ever here and all our stuff's going to Central Kentucky. And I was like, I don't know, but let's have something. Let's do something. She was like, well, this is what I want to do. I was like, okay, let's do it. So this is all because of Tanya. But I want to thank you all for coming out today. And we all learned so much, but it just shows, you know, how we all work together. And from starting with FSA, then we go to conservation to get our soil correct.